All right, good morning, y'all. Welcome to Centennial United Methodist Church at the St. Anthony Park campus. Uh, it's good to be with y'all. Today, even though he's not here yet, we're celebrating uh, Pastor Dave's, oh, there he is. Hey, Pastor Dave, what's up? We're se- celebrating his 40th uh, anniversary of ordination, right? That's what we're doing today? So we're doing some things a little bit different. We're getting ready for uh, for his retirement service, so... This service, uh, there's some, there's some nods to Pastor Dave this morning on, on 40 years. So won't you please stand and sing with us? You came and broke them down You broke them down There were chains around us By your grace we are no longer bound No longer bound You called me out of the grave You called me into the light You called my name and then my heart came alive Hey! Your love is greater Your love is stronger Awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. And hear the song awaken. All creation singing, we're alive. Cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave. You call me into the light. You call my name and then my heart came alive. Say! Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love we found. Death can't hold us down. We shout it out. We're alive. Sure not. And what a love we found. Death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, sure alive, and what a love we found, death can hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, sure alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me, your love is greater. me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Living 
in your freedom, joy overflowing. We know, we know, we know, we know, we know, we know. And our hope forever is the name of Jesus. We are free in you with us. The church is alive. Church is alive, passion burning, vision growing, the church declaring, yeah, we know, we know, we know, we know, we know, we know, and our hope forever is the name of Jesus, we are free church is alive, the church is alive, and our hope, and our hope forever is the name of Jesus, we are free you with us, the church is alive, the church is alive, go ahead. sounds like this is what it looks like this is what it feels like when the church is alive the church is alive Come on, y'all. this is what it sounds like this is what it looks like this is what it feels like when the church is alive the church is alive our hope forever is the name of Jesus. We are free you with us. The church is alive. The church is alive. Our hope and our hope forever is the name of Jesus. We are free you with us. The church is alive. The church is alive. This is what it sounds like. This is what it looks like. This is what it feels like when the church is alive. The church is alive. One more time. This is what it sounds like. This is what it looks like. This is what it sounds like when the church is alive. Sounds fun. It's a good morning. Can you do me a favor and play something pretty in the key of E? Because I'm going to tune as we carry. That was nice. spoke a word where you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so
Pray with me. God, I'm grateful for each and every one of these voices that sings to you this morning. I'm thankful for their story, their unique, unique vision for what this world can be and what and how your presence in their life helps inform that. God, thank you that this is a place where we can come together each one of our unique stories and join together as one body of believers doing our best to connect with you and with one another. God, thank you that you are a God who is constantly in pursuit of us, constantly in pursuit of our hearts. And there is never anything that we can ever do that will separate us from your love. Your love is flawless far-reaching. God, thank you for that grace. Thank you for that healing that comes because of that love. And God, I pray that each and every week we can do our best to offer and extend that love and grace and forgiveness to those we come in contact with, this, those people we meet. Because this doesn't mean anything if we, we keep it here gift. I was once told that grace is God's love freely given. And may that always be the case in our hearts and in our minds. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Would you please be seated? Welcome. Good morning. 
Oh, there we go. Okay. I didn't know if you could hear me. My name is Raquel Moss, and um, <clears throat> I've been coming here for quite a while now. Um, we welcome you here as we are, our mission is to be authentic, thinking, active disciples of Jesus. We welcome you here however you are, wherever you are. Um, we um, have connect cards in the back of the chairs, and there is a QR code, so please um, let us know that you're here. We are help, happy to have the new ones as well as the old. Um, <clears throat> today we have a potluck. And um, our guest speaker downstairs will be with Emma Norton and an update with them. Uh, on Wednesday night, this Wednesday night starting, um, we're going to be having meals and get together starting off our stewardish campaign. And the meal starts at 530 in Roseville. And then the last thing is, is there's trunk, trunk or treat here out here on the 28th, and it's from 4 to 6. So we are looking for volunteers and trunks and treaters. So please come join us at those festivities. Thank you. I totally forgot. We, I love the kids' voices here so much, I forgot to mention. There is Faith Walk downstairs. Um, don't forget your kids when, you're, when the service is done. Uh, so if your kid would like to stay here, that is fine. We do love their squeals and their laughters. Um, scripture passages for you, one from the book of Psalms and one from uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. For all our days pass away under your wrath, our years come to an end like a sigh. The days of our life are 70 years or perhaps 80 if we're strong, even then their span is only toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger? Your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. So teach us to count our days, that we may gain a wise heart. Turn, O Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. And from Ecclesiastes. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. May God add a blessing to this reading of the word. So, as somebody mentioned early on, uh, last Tuesday was the 40th anniversary of my ordination, which is my, the finishing of my preparation for ministry and my entering into uh, the life of a pastor. And um, do we have a picture? Yeah, the guy on the right holding the little boy. Yeah, the little boy is 46 now. And I put this picture on another one like it, which might come up next. Yeah, just so you have a sense of what 40 years really is. Real difference in glasses style. That's what I'm seeing. <laughs> Are they? 
I was hoping to be dead before that happened. Okay. Yeah. So um, I've been thinking a lot, actually, about my impending retirement, but also like what it means to have been in the ministry for 40 years. Uh, and in fact, I, I approached it very um, methodically. About the time that I came here as interim transitional pastor, I also started um, in uh, a course of therapy, psychotherapy, because I had a really specific set of goals um, and objectives that I wanted to, to meet in that process, and it was about making the transition from my working life to my retired life, that I wanted it to be like intentional, and I wanted to like think about what the problems might be, think about who I wanted to be in that life as opposed to who I've been in this life. And if you've been in therapy, you know that you can have goals like that, but then the process itself like takes you in a hundred million directions, all of which are valuable and helpful. So it's been a rich year and a half for me in this kind of reflection. And last summer when I, when I told Whitney and Jen that I wanted to preach on this Sunday, um, on the Sunday of my closest to my ordination um, anniversary, um, I had in mind that I was going to like have a like um, like a come to Jesus sermon or a, a Dutch uncle. Do you know that Dutch uncle? Like your Dutch uncle is the guy who, even if your parents won't tell you how you screwed up, your Dutch uncle takes you aside and tells you the truth and how you need to straighten up. So uh, I tossed around the idea of kind of like being a curmudgeon and this is how you don't measure up. And I decided, yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I want to do that, but uh, there are a lot of <laughs> there are a lot of things that I've thought about, like what has changed in me over the course of forty years, but what also has changed in the church over the last forty years, and uh, really, this guy who was up here a minute ago had a lot of smarts. He was a really smart guy, and he had done some really extensive theological studies at one of the best theological institutions in the Western Hemisphere. And so he knew a lot of things that he didn't understand. And 40 years later, there, I, I've forgotten a lot of the stuff I knew then, but I understand a whole lot more. And so that's what I kind of want to explore with you. And I have four things um, out of the 24 that I thought of originally that I want to share about what I have learned about myself and about y'all in the largest sense of that uh, in the last 40 years. And one of those is about a concept which the theologians call liminality. It's um, lim the liminal is that place between, like Dawn is the liminal phase between nighttime and daytime, and so is twilight between daytime and nighttime. It's that place where two things come together. So the place where God and humanity come together in the person of Jesus Christ, but also in our own persons, as we've talked about the last four weeks, is a liminal space, the place where divine meets human. It's liminal. Where the past meets the future is a liminal moment. So I'm in one now as I approach my retirement. Our confirmands are in a liminal place as they approach their, you know, the beginnings of their spiritual adulthood. Um, so our faith life, our life of faith is intended to be liminal. And the thing about liminal spaces, about these spaces of transition, is what they mostly have in common is that they can be both exciting and frightening. But it's right there in those frightening, exciting places where we don't know what's going to happen next, where we're not in control. That's where most of the growth in life comes, is in those moments. When I make the decision to leave a really safe job in order to follow a really not very clearly defined dream in order to be happy, that's a liminal space, that's a transitional place. And whatever happens in that new job thing, in the leaving of the old job, whatever happens, if it all goes sour or whatever, it's a moment of growth and it takes huge courage to step into that moment. When one marries another human being, that's a liminal moment because you think you know that person 
And you think you know what life is going to be like with that person, but then you get into a life with that person with babies and jobs and all the things that often go with that kind of relationship. You're entirely new territory. And for a while, that relationship is awesome and exciting, and it's like falling off a log, and you don't have any worries, and then suddenly you hit some, some liminal space, right? where one or the other or both of you are changing, or the nature of your relationship is changing, and it's really would be really easy to say, I don't want to stand this close to that line and to walk off from that relationship. What's harder is to confront it and live in that liminal space and to change with it, and what happens in that case is that you have deeper understanding of who you are in relationship to that other person. Everything important that happens in life happens in these moments when we are not sure, when we're taking a chance. And the whole point of our spiritual life together and our spiritual life individually is that that spiritual life is a liminal moment. It's a liminal space. It's a space of transition, of change, of growth. And it, it needs to be at the center of your life. Faith and the spiritual life are an organizing principle, an organizing structure. Whether it's in a, 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 an organized religious center situation like this or whether, you know, it's just smelling the flowers in the woods, whatever it is, it is the place where you structure your existence in the world. Everything else that you do, your family, your job, your spending, your political activities, your social activities, your friends... All of that needs to plug into the spiritual life. It needs to be your priority. It needs to be our priority. And point number two, the spiritual life, in, in the course of my being ordained, the sp I've seen, I've watched the spiritual life and life in church be commoditized, like made into a commodity. And that's really, I don't want to get into an argument about socialism versus capitalism, but it is really one of the risks of living in, an, in a capitalist economy and society, that everything begins to form to that paradigm, that things are a product, that they can be separated, they can be divided, they can be marketed, they could be bought, they could be sold, and the spiritual life has become that. Church life has become that. And I have to say that we have participated wholeheartedly in trying to make our commodity here in this building or in the building down in Roseville or whatever other building your church is in or has been in, we have been involved in making our commodity more marketable, more popular, more sellable than any other piece. And then we divide the life of the church into little chunks that can be marketed and sold so that we have a program for children downstairs and a program for adolescents upstairs and a program for old people over here and a program for this sort of people over there. And, um, and we become like a grocery store with a bunch of separate products on the shelf that people can come in and can buy. But the reality is that the spiritual life isn't a product and you can't buy it. It isn't. This community, if it's going to be anything spectacular, if it's going to be anything world-changing and transformational, it's got to be a community of real people bringing their real selves to talk about what it is like to be a human being and what it is like to be a human being in relationship with the God who created the universe. It's got to be about sharing our insights and our ideas and our experiences. It's got to be about worshiping together. I come up with this, um, this image. I was talking to some colleagues about this, trying to kind of play out some of these ideas, and suddenly this image popped into my mind because, you know, I'm... I'm about to go off my Presbyterian healthcare system, which is like a Cadillac thing, and I'm going to be in Medicare pretty soon here. So I'm looking at all these different programs and stuff. And one of the things that like is really cool is like this silver sneaker thing where you get like free or like really cheap gym membership. So I'm thinking about like, you know, that's going to be my next step in my getting myself put back together. 
and looking like I, black guy instead of this guy, thinking about dyeing my hair, and wearing skinny ties, and weird glasses. Yeah, I know, right? But so I had this image, I've had this in my mind, I had this image of a gym where they sold a special kind of uh, gym membership where you could only go one day a week. And you go one day a week to the gym, and you don't actually exercise on that one day. You just go and watch other people exercise. And that's like, like I would not pay money for that, would you? I would, no. Because what's the point? You don't get cardio built up. You don't get your muscles strong and working together. You don't get a core that like keeps your back from hurting all the time. You don't get any of that from watching other people exercise. You have to invest in it pretty seriously, a couple, three times a week, spending an hour there, like actually changing your clothes and taking a shower and like getting into it. It takes an investment. It takes a priority to make that happen. There is all kinds of spiritual transformation that can happen in this space where people love each other, respect each other, admire each other, accept each other's differences, and where we bring all of that into the presence of God and worship God for it. There are things that can happen in the midst of that that are just amazing, that can become like the structure and fabric and skeleton of your spiritual life that holds you up in times when things are really rough and that can help you find the joy in anything. But that requires a workout more than once a week, coming and being a spectator. And this whole commoditization thing, which I've seen just like getting worse and worse over the decades, it contributes to the idea that you can walk into a church and, you know, if you don't come away feeling measurably better than when you walked in, you should just walk off and find another grocery store that has better spiritual products for you to purchase. But that doesn't exist because what's real is what happens in our midst. And I have to say, what happens in our midst face-to-face? -face? Zoom and live streaming and everything, they're great tools, and they allow us to do certain things in addition to our core mission that enhance our mission together, allow people to participate who cannot otherwise do it. Um, we have people who go to the Roseville campus who now that they're older, they can't get up and get to church by 9 o'clock, not because they don't want to, but just because that does not work for them. And so for them, the, the, the online stuff is a real blessing, but it's not the core of the church, and it can't be. Because we are the body of Christ. We are the incarnation of Jesus Christ in the world right now. You know, there's the incarnation of Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, becoming Jesus of Nazareth and living in our midst and all of that. But the other flip side of the incarnation is that we have God incarnate in us even as Jesus has ascended back into the realms of heaven. And embodiment is just that. It involves bodies together in the same place so that you can see the tear that's about to drop on your friend's face or so that you can see that little bit of a smile that's curling up at the corners in the midst of a hard conversation. Those are things you can only experience when you're right here doing something important together. And that means time. That means energy. That means prioritization. There are many wonderful, useful, helpful things that you can use your time for but when you are sitting by your spouse's bedside waiting for them to die, none of those things are going to help you in the way that a strong, vital, spiritual life connected to a strong, vital, spiritual community will do for you. That's what I know for my 40 years. So, wisely enough, so that I didn't give you all 38 things, I put... So the third thing is, and you're going to think to yourself, oh, he's a guy who sings, so for him, so everybody has to think music is really important. But here's the thing. Can you name a single culture 
out, you know, there are what, 542 living languages on planet Earth and cultures to go with each one of them and each, some of them have multiple cultures all speaking that language. All of those cultures across the span of history and across the wide globe of the human family is there one culture in which people do not sing together. There isn't one which suggests that singing, making music alone and with other people is a core human trait. The anthropologists think that singing emerged from keening, that the making of sounds that are the vocalization of grief, that that is how singing emerged. And then somehow we discovered, well, if it's good for that emotion, maybe it's good for joy or happiness or all the other emotions that we put into our music. It's a core reality of human beings. And what I've seen happen, and this is related to the commoditization of life, is that I was born in 1957, and the recording industry was just getting going post-war. So... Um, you know, who's the hip guy? Uh, Elvis Presley, you know, b all the big thing. And then there was Doris Day and, you know, the, you know. But over the course of my lifetime, um, the music industry has increasingly taken over our musical lives. And other people sing for us. And so we don't think we should sing because we're not as good as that person that we listen to on our records. And the reason that we can't ever sound as good as them is because they don't sound as good as them. Their voices, their everything is run through a computer and all of the pitches are right on and all the harmonies are right there because it's been manufactured, it's been commoditized, and we buy it. I buy my, um, my classical music and, um, you know, I don't know, Logan buys his whatever he listens to and Whitney buys her music and sometimes we listen to it together but not very often you see more and more of us walking through crowded spaces like the grocery store where we maybe used to greet our neighbors who are now like listening or looking at our phones um, music is essential to our spiritual lives because in music something happens that doesn't happen in any other thing that we do our brains our hearts our spirits and our bodies are all joined together in the same. It's a very integrating experience. And if we're doing it in a group of people, it's not just our brains, our hearts, our bodies, our spirits, but it's the community that we build together. Singing something that we all know, like Amazing Grace. Everybody knows that hymn. We, you know, we get together, we sing it a lot because it's the one thing that we all know. Maybe Christmas carols too. But we feel that sense of connectedness that singing gives to us. And its loss in this culture is a new thing that has never happened before to human beings. And we see levels of depression and anxiety and other forms of mental illness. And you got to wonder, they've been on the rise at the same time as this phenomenon now, coincidence is not causation, as the scientists will remind me, but it makes you wonder. Because singing is a thing that we have done forever, always, in every place, and now we've stopped. And it's one of the major ways that a community comes to feel like an us, a we, instead of a bunch of fragmented eyes. That's the third thing. Fourth thing. Now, just feel your luck because, you know, it could have been 34. But the fourth thing is what I've learned in 40 years. I knew this with my brain, and I knew I was supposed to know this when I was that guy. Uh, but it's over the course of 40 years of living a life in the church and living a spiritual life with my wife and my kids and, my, and our family, I have come to realize that the Holy Spirit... Is like a real thing. It's an actual thing. It's not just a churchy word or concept that we throw around. I have come to understand that the Holy Spirit is at work in me and with me all the time. 
and that's a huge relief. It also gives me the freedom to walk along those liminal lines of transition between light and dark and day and night and God and humanity and the future and the past and what I want to be compared to what I am. It gives me the courage to step out along those liminal spaces where everything of importance in human life happens. She's a real creature, a re not a creature, because she is God. She is a real entity who shows up at the most amazing times in the most amazing ways. In, in my personal experience, but I've also seen it so many times, like watching a whole congregation of people or a leadership group or something where everybody sort of gets it, or they're all working on a really hard, heart-wrenching thing that has to be dealt with in the congregation, and you can see their hearts and minds coming together as a, as a whole so that they can make holistic and integrative decisions. And it's just like, I can't, I didn't do this. They didn't do this. This is the thing that has been done among us and see it all the time. The first time I preached like this without any notes was on a Monday Thursday. And I went to my office, I was typing away, I finished it and I sent it to the printer. It was an old dot matrix printer. Anybody remember what those were? But you had to choose uh, a printer definition before you sent it. So I just punched, left, came back in my robe to rip off the pages. And you know what that's like. With, you know, you've got the tractor tabs that you've got to pull off and it's, you've got to pull them apart. Uh, but I got there and um, I had chosen the wrong printer definition. And um, it had a page advance command, but no line advance command. So all of my sermon was in a black stripe across the top of each page. And it was time to go to church. So I thought, well, I guess I know what I'm going to say. And I went out there and I preached that sermon. I don't know whether I left anything out or if I added stuff I hadn't planned on. But my congregation said, you need to preach like that all the time. That was the best sermon you ever preached. So I said, okay. But then the next Sunday was Easter. I wasn't going to do that. And then Sunday after Easter, and then the Sunday after that, and then the Sunday after that. One Sunday in early June, I was sitting in my office do, at 4 o'clock in the morning, which was a thing I did, and everything was going according to plan. It was right on schedule. I was halfway through typing it. I knew exactly where it was going. And I, I, I lifted one finger to make one more t keystroke, and I learned the, the definition of the word ennui because in that moment, I felt it. It was like, I do not want to do this anymore. So I turned off the computer. I spent the next couple, three hours wandering around the church, kind of putting ideas, making a map, you know. I got up, on the, you know, in the worship at the time of the sermon, I stood in the pulpit, and I looked down at the lectern where normally my manuscript would be laying for me, waiting, and it was empty. And I panicked. And in that moment, and, this, and I swear this is true, and I swear it is the only time in my life when I ever had this experience, but I heard a voice. And the voice said, get out of the pulpit, go talk to your friends. And so I did, and so I have been doing forever. And I have to say that this event of preaching is way more fun for me, and reportedly for other people as well, um, now that I've left that behind, because Every Sunday morning that I am preaching is a liminal moment. It is a transitional moment. It's a step out in faith. I don't know what's going to happen kind of a moment. I said in, uh, over at Roseville, I said, I've always sort of wanted to use the metaphor of surfing for this experience, but I've never surfed. I said, have any of you ever surfed? And uh, Brandon, one of the confirmands, is in the, like towards the back with his parents, and he timidly waves his hand, and I said, so tell, you can tell me, is it like this? And I said, it's like you get up there, you catch that wave, and you are committed. You have no idea where it's going to take it. You do not know if you're going to wipe out. You do not know if you're going to make it to the beach. You just do not know what's going to happen, and it is like more fun than anything you can imagine. And he nodded his head <laughs> that that was what it was like. So, but I couldn't do what I do. I honestly could not do what I do if I did not believe that the Holy Spirit like, is in that process and is, it, is in it with me. I do my homework. I, I put my stuff together. I make some plans. I think about how the, you know, it's not like I just like get up here and start wagging my tongue, but what comes into a, somebody's laughing back there. 
And I know your name, Sharon. So. <laughs> but if the Holy Spirit were not a real deal, I could not do that. And I wouldn't have started doing that. So my, you know, my last thing about what I've learned in the ministry and in the midst of churches is the Holy Spirit is a real deal. And you need to learn how to make her a part of your spiritual life part of your spiritual journey, but also how to trust her enough to show up when you're doing stuff together, because you will just be amazed at the things that are possible when you give her your trust. And if you don't like me calling the Holy Spirit her, that's fine. You can fire me after November. Anyway, Thank you for letting me reflect on what these years have meant and kind of what I'm taking to the future. I hope that it is helpful. Thanks be to God. Can I move this over? Well, this is the time in our service that we ask you to think about the different ways of giving. We give with our hearts, through our prayers and our service, but we also need uh, prayers to think about what we give with our monetary as mm -hmm. well. So this is the time. You can use the QR code that's up on the screen, or we'll have people coming around collecting. Thank you. As the ushers continue to walk among you, I'd call your attention up to this table. And Dave, I don't know if you meant to do this. We'll just say it was that wonderful Holy Spirit that did it. But friends, we're starting our stewardship campaign and sermon series next week. And it's all about asking and taking time to ask yourself, how are we living in and actually practicing these aspects of our faith. When we join as members of a church, we promise to give of our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. And sometimes we can say, yes, I'll do that, and then kind of expect it to happen naturally. But the next five weeks are going to be all about taking one of those vows at a time and saying, how am I offering my prayers, my presence, my gifts, my service, and my witness? And how is God daring me to go a little deeper in each of those? So I appreciate that these are muscles 
that we need to flex and work out. We can't just wait for them to get bigger. I've tried that diet plan and it doesn't work. I have, I've really tried it. Coming to this table and receiving these gifts is like that. It is a time where we get to practice, we get to come forward, walk forward, actually receive something in our hands that reminds us, that restores our belief in God's grace that is real for us, that we are invited into every single time we come together to worship God, to sit alongside one another in life. So we come to this table and we remember Jesus. We remember how on his last night on earth, when he knew what was coming and was asking himself that question that we could ask, if you had one day left, what would you do? He gathered with his friends, with his disciples, with those he had gone through the trials of of ministry with. And he gathered around a table and wanted them to know the love that is going to get them through the hardest parts that were yet to come. In the middle of that supper, he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body. This is my whole self given for you. Every time you eat of this bread, he said, remember that, remember me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples And said, drink from this cup, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you, for many, for all, for the forgiveness of sin. Every time you drink of this cup, he said, remember that, remember me. Family of faith, let's pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh, O Holy Spirit. Sophia, fall afresh on all of us gathered here, on the names and places and faces that are especially on our hearts today in prayer, all those in the Middle East, all those in places that are experiencing such anxiety and such trauma, on all the people we know that are grieving and mourning this day, and on all of us who have reason to celebrate to reflect, oh God, we give you thanks and we ask your refreshing spirit to fall on us and on these simple gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us, oh God, the body and blood of Christ so that we may be the body of Christ in this world that is set free by your love and forgiveness and sacrifice for us. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. And we pray our Lord's prayer as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Family of faith, these are the gifts of God for you, for me, for us, for all, for the people of God. I would invite the communion servers to come forward, and as they prepare to serve you, I would remind you that no matter who you are, what you've done, where you come from, or what's been done to you, you are welcome here. You are invited to come receive the bread and the cup. There will be ushers that will guide you forward when you get to the front. You'll be handed a piece of bread and invited to take a little cup of juice. There will be gluten-free bread right here in the middle and sealed elements if that is your preference. But come and let us celebrate the gifts of God. Amen.
Gives me an opportunity to tell you all that uh, there's going to be one service on November 19th, which is Dave's retirement service. He'll be at the Roseville campus. Uh, so we'll meet up at 10:30. And uh, this next song that we're going to do is just a, a practice for the 19th. Uh, you'll know it as "Be Thou My Vision," but Dave has requested for his retirement that we change it to "Be Thou Our Vision." So let's give it a shot, yeah. Would you please stand?
God's been that God. Yeah. Like yeah. Birth, right. That but that's the form that my wife and I sang it at our wedding. Okay. So it has real resonance for me. It may have even been sung at my ordination. Thank you, Grayson. Johann Grayson, Grayson Bach Bicknell. Uh, <laughs> nice job. Meant a lot to me. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the power and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us both now and forever. And all God's people shouted... Amen. Hold on. There we go. Please join us downstairs for a potluck. You can get down there, stair just find a stairwell and go down. We'll see you there. Even if you didn't bring anything, fishes and loaves, it works every time. So we'll see you down there. <laughs>